But I just wanted to welcome you for the new semester and new theme. Uh, beginning the fall of uh, last year, we started a thematic seminars. And so the first theme was Ayurveda in America and St. Rose Martin Branches. Very successful theme. And uh, we had uh, wonderful presentations. And this semester, we are starting Culturing Education in America series, seminar series. And our first speaker, as you, did, you already know, is Maury Hall, but uh, more introduction from our seminar coordinator, Dr. Gary Salter. Thank you for coming down. I have a few words. I'm going to take up a little bit of her time, hopefully not too much. I want to welcome you all to the Center for Indic Studies uh, seminar series for fall 2011. Uh, the center was established, as you probably know, to highlight and disseminate India's gifts to the world. During the past eight years, these monthly seminars have highlighted a broad range of topics, including science, spirituality, art, music, food, culture, political science, to name just a few. Uh, last spring, for the first time, we organized uh, a the, all the seminars around a theme, Ayurveda in America, Ancient Roots, and Modern Branches. Uh, for this fall, uh, we've decided to focus upon a theme topic uh, 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 to give a taste of what India brings to the table uh, on the topic of great importance in America today, education. Uh, so uh, we are titling this Culturing Education in America. Uh, now on board first is uh, Dr. Hall, of course, uh, which you're here for today. But let me go through slowly uh, some of the other participants in this seminar. Uh, first of all, let me stop to say uh, uh, a word about this. Uh, we have a special event coming up uh, on uh, October 16th, uh, and this, uh, uh, not in this venue, in uh, CDPA 153. Uh, it's a celebration of the Tagore uh, tradition. And um, uh, uh, you need reservations. For this, and you need to contact uh, Dr. Singapta, who's here uh, today, uh, if you would like to contact him before you leave uh, today. Uh, or you can reach him by email or that phone number uh, on, on here. Uh, it looks like a very good uh, day on a Sunday, October 16th, of, uh, uh, of, of to go activities. What time? 5 p.m. Five. Oh, didn't I put that? No. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's from five to seven. Five to seven p.m. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, next month, uh, actually only a few weeks away, will be uh, Madhu Suri Prakash. Uh, now, uh, uh, we are very pleased that she could come here for the. Uh, uh, for the Gandhi Distinguished Speaker Series lecture, um, and uh, she's from Penn State University. She keeps moving here. Um, I'm going to have to go back and forth. Uh, 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 Madhu Suri Prakash is an educational philosopher from Penn State University, and she prefers to be called Madhu. Uh, and she's an outspoken advocate and activist for people and for grassroots movements, environmental awakening and sustainability and justice. And so she will be co-sponsored by the sustainability program and also by Dr. Hall's program, the uh, program in uh, education, public policy, civic engagement. Civic engagement. Okay. Uh, at UMass Dartmouth uh, will also be uh, sponsoring her presence here. Uh, look forward to her because her, dis her name comes up in discussions of Wendell Berry, uh, Satish Kumar, Barbara Kingsolver, Howard Zinn, 
Uh, she is of like mind and personality, um, and she is a, an outspoken advocate um, for, um, uh, for the work of Gandhi, Tagore, Wendell Berry, and Ivan Illich in, uh, in, in, in all of her professional activities. The month after, in November, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me just mention that uh, uh, she'll be here at on October 7th, Friday, October 7th, for a noon formal lecture. And then in the evening of the same day, in the same venue, this room, uh, she will give a, an informal Friday evening conversation, uh, uh, Escaping Education or School in the World. And I believe she plans to have a film and then a discussion of that film that we'll take part in as a group. Uh, uh, the next month on Friday, November 4th, uh, for the Acharya Ramsmuj uh, Memorial Lecture for 2011, uh, we have a special event in that uh, Pandit Ramadin Ramsmuj uh, will honor his father uh, in discussing the influence that his father had on his own uh, development of the salt theory and the ABA schools system, which we'll hear about today from uh, uh, Dr. Hall. Uh, and then finally, uh, we find uh, a little different twist here. It's interesting that, uh, that meditation, of course, comes from centuries ago uh, from the Indus Valley. And we have uh, today, who would have thought that in uh, the 21st century, uh, meditation would be a medical treatment uh, that's available to patients. Well, that brings up the need for teaching or educating the public and healthcare workers about the benefits and possibilities and the different mindset required uh, to involve oneself in. So we are fortunate to have one of the founders of the UMass Worcester uh, School of Medicine Mindfulness uh, Program, uh, Elena Rosenbaum, uh, who herself was a cancer patient, uh, and through her own cancer experience, uh, uh, discovered mindfulness uh, meditation, and was able to, uh, to assist her healing process through it. She was so impressed that she, in fact, uh, uh, went on to uh, continue that after her survival uh, from, from ca cancer. She continues on at uh, UMass uh, Mindfulness uh, Program in, uh, in Worcester. So that's our program for the, uh, for the year. that for you with the dimmed lights. So um, I um, am going to give you a talk on narrative light mapping in the classroom. And um, just for time's sake, um, I know that um, I have a couple of examples of my research, and I may only get through one example, but I want to give you an overview. Um, so first of all, sort of where we're going. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me about my Fulbright in India, um, about my current research trajectory, um, an overview of the salt components I turned from theory into practice for my Fulbright, about the Kuruam Vidalia School in India, which was founded by Dr. Balram Singh. Uh, Balram, if you just raise your hand, everybody knows. Oh, both hands, okay. And that was the school in his village that he started in 2009. Um, and then I'm going to give you some research examples of how I used um, some components of salt with Robert Frost poetry with the teachers at Balram School and with some other students around India. Um, and then some insights, new directions, and further work because I feel like my work with salt has really just begun. Um, so uh, first of all, I just want to express some gratitude um, that that's very, you know, my experience with Indian people here and in India is that they're very hospitable people and they are very um, thankful and 
I think that gratitude is something that we can all practice and it enriches our lives, I think. So I want to thank UMass Dartmouth, the Center for Indic Studies, Dr. Balram Singh, other supportive colleagues, uh, the Fulbright Organization, and my students. And that is a picture of a mustard field near Balram's uh, school. He loves mustard, and mustard has wonderful properties, Ayurvedic and other. Um, so who am I? Well, so I know many of you, some of you I don't know. Uh, my name is Maureen Hall. I'm an associate professor of education in the School of Education, Public Policy, and Civic Engagement, the rather uh, awkward SEPSI acronym here at UMass Dartmouth since 2003. I was on sabbatical last year, or the fall of 2010, spring of 2011, and I also was awarded a five-month Fulbright Nehru Research Fellowship in India, which I was really excited about. Um, in 2003, I got my PhD from University of Virginia. I was a doctoral student at UVA from 1998 to 2003. And before that, I was a teacher in New Hampshire. I taught seventh and eighth grade for five years and high school for five years. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the Fulbright. Raise your hand if you know a little bit about the Fulbright. A little bit about the Fulbright organization. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. It was started in 1946 by J. William Fulbright. Um, and he actually used uh, leftover war weapons, sold them, and created a program to create mutual understanding around the world. Um, it started in 1946. And um, now, in 2011, there are 180 countries that American teachers, researchers, and students go to. And students and researchers and teachers from those 180 countries come to the United States. So it's a really amazing program. And I've given you both the, um, the you want to go to CIES.org if you're a teacher, student, or researcher. And um, the actual Fulbright India address is the USIEF, the United States India Educational Foundation. That's where you would find out information about um, if you're interested in a particular Fulbright in India, or CIES if you're interested in a Fulbright in any of the other 179 countries. So, a little map of India here. Um, as far as I know, it's about a third the size of America, um, land-wise. And oops, I, was, um, I was actually in, in, in nine Indian states. I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there's 28 Indian states. I mean, I could go back for the rest of my life and still not see all of the places and experience all of the different cultures of India. It's a very rich culture. But I landed in Delhi, which is in North Central India, and Balram School is in Uttar Pradesh, which is a state that, a joint that's next to uh, Delhi. But I went all over, and actually, I, you know, for the, the ramifications of this talk, really can't take you to all the other places that I went, um, but I hope to give other talks about my experiences because, you know, seven months in India does not make a 35-minute presentation. So um, I'm excited to share more of my experiences. But I want to give you just a feel for where I was. Um, Uttar Pradesh um, uh, is a North Indian state. It's sort of where I'm turning around in that area. So. Um, just a thumbnail sketch of my research trajectory. Um, as a 7th and 8th grade teacher and as a 9th and 11th grade teacher, um, I really um, felt that students learn best in community. And I've studied quite a bit of that. In fact, my dissertation from the University of Virginia was a qualitative study as to how one teacher created a community of trust in a writing classroom. And that's informed my work to date. Now, of course, there's Indian influences that are, that are morphed into that now. Um, but when I came to UMass Dartmouth, moving from community to cognitive affective learning on the right, number two, um, basically, there's all sort of, uh, I don't know if you call it ed education ease. There's sort of a language of education. Um, I see K through 12 teachers who are really good, and college teachers who are really good are cognitive affective practitioners. But they probably don't see themselves as that. What cognitive affective learning is, is that when you learn something, you don't separate cognition from affect. You have an experience. And so when you're noticing, you know, you're teaching a subject, but you're teaching particular students that subject. And so that's a real different thing than just being a content specialist. Um, cognitive affective learning, um, I think, is very important. And it's funny, I was a part of the Carnegie program for three years. Um, Actually, one of my colleagues, Frank Scarano, raise your hand, he's in medical laboratory science. 
And I had to get four other colleagues at UMass that would work on working on some um, scholarship of teaching and learning projects to uh, support cognitive affective learning. And actually for Frank, it was what does it mean to be a med lab professional? What does that mean? And so the cognitive affective dimensions of that. For me, is what does it mean to become a teacher? And, and what kinds of things do you need to know about student learning, about cognition and affect that will help you as a practitioner and help deepen student learning? Cognitive affective learning led for me into contemplative practices and pedagogy. And really, to simplify that, as Jerry said, um, many of these contemplative practices came originally from India. And basically, contemplative practices in learning means that you, you are learning in the present moment, as we are all here together right now at this moment. If you're thinking about what you have to do next or what you did before, you're not in the present moment. And actually, meditation, yoga, chanting, pranayam, all sorts of things are, are ways that you can bring students to the present moment. I do some contemplative writing with my students. I have a meditation bell, which comes from a Buddhist background, but I usually ask my students, is there anyone here who's not breathing? And nobody, everybody's breathing. And I say, well, we're going to intentionally breathe. So that's how I start each class, and I work some writing into that that connects to the reading. Um, that, of course, led me to the contemplative traditions of India. But really, even though um, you know, one, of the, um, one of the wonderful things about, um, about um, well, it's Balram, I see him as a role model. Um, he has a lot of humility, so he doesn't see himself as this way. But I feel like um, my relationship with him helped me go to India. And he, as soon as I got the Fulbright, I emailed him. And he wrote, I said, I got the Fulbright. And he wrote back, things just happen. We are just witnesses. And, um, but I, I was telling Annie Hayes, one of my students earlier, that um, the first time I met Balram, I started teaching here in 2003. And he had a yogi visiting. And there was a sign for free yoga classes. And I thought, oh, I'm a little stressed, new culture. I'll go to the yoga class. So I went, and that's the first night that I met Balram, and he said, oh, you're in education? Maybe you can help us. Because the way that the culture of India is taught in America is completely inaccurate. So we've been working together ever since. So, um, and I think you know, the best is yet to come with some of our projects. So, um, but I, do th I don't know if it's, you know, we are just witnesses and things just happen. Um, but maybe that's because I'm not Indian. <laughs> so but, uh, anyway, I appreciate. Um, I'm just old enough. What's that? <laughs> so, so anyway, that's a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of where I am. Um, this is Balram School in India. Um, I'm actually standing on the roof of the guest house taking this picture. So the guest house is across the street from the school. And the, the first floor of the guest house has been built. When you walk in, you can walk up to the second story. It doesn't exist yet, so you're on the roof, which is really beautiful. And you can also take pictures of the school across the street. The second story is going to be built soon. Um, but uh, it is a, a very unusual school. It is um, grades 1 through 9 now. The goal of it is to be um, solely for girls. But there are girls and boys that go there. This year, they started to take ninth graders. So it was grades 1 through 8. So this is uh, very close, like literally like a two-minute walk from Balram's family home. So this is where he grew up. And um, it is a private school. But um, the tuition to go there is quite small. Um, and uh, they teach both, uh, they teach Hindi, Sanskrit, and English at this school. And um, it's very, it's a different kind of rural school. Um, it's actually, I think, kind of a, um, a sort of a center of light for uh, some other models of schools in India. Um, so, Pandit Ramsamush, if you could raise your hand, both hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He is the father of the super accelerated learning theory, which is um, what my project was on for my Fulbright in India. So I was awarded a five-month research uh, fellowship. And basically, I didn't do the whole um, SALT theory, because it's very large. But I, what I did is I took five components of the super accelerated learning theory. And a lot of these components come from Indian practices. And um, what I did. Uh, was I was investigating the efficacy of the super accelerated learning theory at Balram School. Um, and I've documented and created a series of reports capturing the methods used in salt-derived pedagogy. So um, we're trying to make those 
available to other people. And the one that I'm going to talk about is, is one component. These are the five components of SALT that I turned from theory into practice. And of course, this work is ongoing. But the first one, visualization and mental practice. Even the table that we're sitting at, someone had an idea in their head before the table manifested. So the importance of visualization and mental practice for learning. Multiple intelligences, we happen to live in an era of standardized testing, and that privileges left brain learners. So there's a whole lot of right brain learners that maybe are a lot smarter than the tests say they are. And I think as teachers, we need to broaden the ways that we teach, because it's not how smart are you, it's how are you smart, because you can be smart in so many different ways. And if teachers broaden the way that they teach, students are smarter than they think. Um, Number three, patterns and mnemonics. Um, ways of remembering things um, is a piece of, is a piece of um, super accelerated learning theory. Learning through yoga and meditation. Um, is there anybody here who took the science of Kriya Yoga with Dr. Singh? Okay, we have one alumni from that class. Um, basically, Balram uses uh, yoga and meditation to teach scientific concepts. And, you know, it's sort of thinking about, you're learning about science, always thinking about it's outside you, but really you're walking around in a pretty incredible body that's full of science. And so to understand science through yoga and meditation is a very important uh, way of doing that. And learning through story or narrative. And this is the example I'm going to give you using poetry. But basically, we know I'm not a neuroscientist, but I, I admire the work of a lot of neuroscientists. And we live in a very interesting time because we're learning more and more about how the brain works. And we have mirror neurons. And so when you read a book, you experience that vicariously. You have that experience that the writer is describing. Or if you go to a movie and you, your mirror neurons are activated, you're mapping your own life onto what you're watching. And so um, this learning through story or narrative um, to map your own life stories onto what you're learning, I think is a very effective way, and that's what this seminar is about, narrative life mapping. Um, so my first task was to distill those parts, those five parts, the visualization, multiple intelligence, mnemonics, learning through yoga and meditation, and learning through narrative or story. Um, and I did travel around India a lot, and I was able to do some experiments in other places. I was in Pondicherry, which is in Southeast East India, I was in Kerala, which is in Southwest India, and I was in a total of nine Indian states. But in Uttar Pradesh, which is where Balram's village is and where Kuruam Vidalia is, his school, that's where I worked with the teachers mainly um, at that school. Um, and what is it about? I mean, an overarching element of SALT is learning through the self. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes, and I don't even know who it's by, but it's that revelations are only for those who are having them. Revelations are only for those who are having them. Because um, for me, the importance of learning through the self was really highlighted in India. So I didn't know I was going to have that revelation. But that's really connected um, to SALT, and it's really important in terms of community and in way that you create um, teaching and learning experiences for your students. Uh, what kind of pedagogy is promoted? Uh, well, methods of teaching should be such that the learner is enabled to discover by means his or her own development, and that the role of the teacher is to be a guide and a facilitator, and that teacher-student rapport is highlighted. The teacher should evoke within the learner the aspiration to find truth by his or own, her own exercise of faculties. So this using narrative or story, component number five of super accelerated learning theory, these are some examples um, using poetry. I want to stop, and um, I suppose this is some self-promotion too, but I just finished a book with Bob Waxler. Um, and in this book, I have, I have actually used some of these poetry examples um, of how to map your own life story onto poems. Um, and on October 17th, we're having an event at Barnes & Nobles. I hope some of you can come. It's at 7 o'clock um, on a Thursday night. But I have to backtrack a little bit. When I was in India, um, I would tell people I have two really important professional partnerships, one with Balram Singh and one with Bob Waxler. And if you can imagine for a minute that they're riding on magic carpets and they each have their own visions, and they have invited me to ride along with them on their, on their, car on their carpets. 
Well, the only person who was not excited about me going to India was Bob Waxler. I love Bob Waxler, but this is what he said to me. Do you have to go to India now? I said, yes, I want a Fulbright. I have to go to India now. My deadline for the book with Bob Waxler was January 26th. So I went to India in September 2010. And I was true to my commitment with him, but I had to find a way to connect my Fulbright work with my literacy work. So I have done that. So anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But um, actually I got an email from Bob yesterday. I can't come to your event. I hope you're going to mention the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I have. So um, before you can work with students, you have to establish community with them. And it's not like there's a recipe for that. If there were a recipe for that, we would have robots teaching. But what works for one person doesn't work for another. But when I first worked with the teachers at Balram School, um, basically the way that they had learned previous to my appearance was that they would listen to the teacher and memorize and maybe ask their friends later at a coffee shop or in passing, what did she mean by that? And maybe ask the teacher a question. Um, I was trying to get them to take a story of their own life and map it onto what we were learning. And that was really hard for them. So I first had to create a place, a space, where they could be safe in risking. That it was OK, that there's no such thing as a dumb question. The only dumb question is the question you don't ask. And so I asked them these questions. I did some presentations on community before I started doing the super accelerated learning theory, although community is a part of super accelerated learning theory. So I asked them, what does it mean to learn in community with others? Why is community in a classroom important? How can you create the best learning environments for your students within your classroom, in the larger school? And what makes you feel a part of the learning community? So all of those things were really important. Um, and some of them you know, said, well, I don't feel, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that I'm right when I offer an answer. And that's part of learning because a lot of times um, I know you have to do one of Balram's things, almost better to fail, and you have, what's your philosophy with that? Why is it better to fail the first time? I can't remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> something like you have more time to redo it the right way, or oh, I don't yeah, know, yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I was in his office one day, and someone that he wrote a grant with, they didn't get the grant, and you said, but life is a drama, and now we have more time for the drama. <laughs> yeah. I think it was something like that. So. Um, I would even use pictures. These are pictures, like I so how we're half in the light. These are the teachers at Balram School. You can see Balram over there. Who I do, I mean, he is Balram saying unique unto the world, but he does look like an Indian Einstein. So he's over there. And then the teachers and I would say, now see how we're half in the light and half in the dark? We started to create community. We're half in the, the light is growing. And they would laugh, you know. But I meant it because I'm, you know, yet they had to learn to trust that it was okay that what experiments I was going to do with them were safe and that they were going to learn for themselves and they were also going to learn some things they could try with their own students. And the first time I met the teachers, this was at a wedding that we went to. One of the male teachers in the school got married and that was the first day that I was, or the second day I was at Balram School, we went to a wedding in Sultanpur, which is also in Uttar Pradesh. So, to the research. So, um, probably, how many of you know the road not taken? Okay, well, you might not know one step backward taken, but this is another Robert Frost poem. Um, I love Robert Frost. I know he's not just a nature poet. Uh, it's much deeper than that. Um, I took a course uh, with a professor at UMass Amherst. That's where I went as an undergrad. And my professor knew Robert Frost when Robert Frost was a poet in residence at Amherst College. And it's so funny because my professor would tell me, oh, I run into Robert Frost at the supermarket, and I always have a line. What did you mean in that line? He would ask him, you know, and Robert Frost is like trying to get his groceries and stuff. And my professor's asking him, what did you mean? And, um, but anyway, I um, wrote a grant with Bob Waxler a couple of years ago, and um, we built into the grant um, 30 uh, collected poems of Robert Frost, the, the, the 30 books of his total work. And as a, as a full writer, I could send a diplomatic couch to India, so I was able to send those books to India, and then I gave them to the teachers at Balram School. And so we used Robert Frost poetry for some of these super accelerated learning theory experiments. So basically, I would say, OK, here's a poem. 
Here are the learning goals for the poem. I want you to learn what an image is and be able to give examples from the poem. I want you to understand the term symbol, specifically the idea in this poem, which has to do with stepping back to prevent something bad, either physical or psychological danger. And then understand how SALT component number five, learning through narrative or story, operates in teaching and learning. So obviously when you're teaching teachers, there's levels of medical.